Welcome back. When I first began inviting big name Australians on to the couch here for longer form interviews, my colleague Peter Credlin urged me to get Jane Holton on the show. Now, I wasn't overly familiar with this lifetime senior public servant, and with the pandemic underway, Jane got a little bit busy. Not only was she a director on some of the most high profile company boards in the country, Jane became a COVID commissioner the key reviewer on hotel quarantine and chair of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. And that's a group under the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, no less. As Peter Credlin told me, Jane Holton can do anything. And it's not an overstatement to say that she is awfully close to being the most powerful woman in this country. Jane Holton, welcome to the virtual couch. How are you? I'm very, very well. Uh, for a career public servant, your role during the pandemic has been the antithesis of what you were. You've been very public. You've been the public face of COVID management and information. How have you coped with that role? Well, you're quite right, Chris. It's not a normal position for someone who used to be a bureaucrat uh, to have a fairly public role. But one of the things I've always taken quite seriously is my role in public education. And at a time like this where um, clear voices and people with knowledge about what's going on can help uh, ordinary Australians, regardless of where they are around the country, understand what's going on and, and take the steps to protect themselves and their families. Um, I was told very early on that it would be helpful if I did that, and that's what I've been doing ever since. So you're right, a bit out of my comfort zone, but so far, so good. <laughs> so far, so good. A very complex and surreal crisis for average Australians, this, and you cannot fall short when it comes to intensive guidance. We need explanation, don't we? That, look, that's right. And I think one of the challenges uh, for many people is to hear in clear language what's currently going on, um, what the advice is, and then what we can expect. And I think for, for many people, hearing quite complex academic arguments or political argy-bargy doesn't help people in their day-to-day -day lives. So one of the things I've been trying to do is speak in really clear language for people to help them understand. Now, viewers will find this totally and utterly spooky, but 10 weeks before China told us about this virus that has been set free from somewhere, you were gaming a pandemic at an international conference, were you not? Yes, and what's even spookier, Chris, is I was sitting next to the head of the Chinese CDC, the Centre for Disease Control, George Gao, while we did that gaming. So oh. um, spooky doesn't even quite go close. Mm-hmm. I could imagine how eerie it was for you when you heard the news. You were on holidays at the time and all of a sudden someone tells you that this very virulent virus has started to take lives in Wuhan. It must have been so eerie. Absolutely, and I think I've talked about this publicly, that uh, I was in an airport, actually, in the United States. I was going skiing on holiday, and I got a phone call, um, as one often does in, if you work internationally in these areas, just telling me about something that looked a bit weird. Um, and you just had this horrible sense. And, in fact, I, I remember it clearly. My, my stomach just did this little kind of knot. And you think, oh, no, no, maybe it isn't that bad. But, of course, uh, the phone calls continued and escalated. And as we all now know, um, this has turned into a global pandemic, the likes of which have not been seen in any of our lifetimes. So, yes, it's a moment I remember extremely clearly. And in some ways, as I've spoken to epidemiologists about, we've had this new virus, we've got this new variant, Delta, which has changed all our considerations and protocols right around the world, hasn't it? Look, Delta is really infectious. And look, what you see with these kinds of viruses, and people are familiar with flu, and you know that if you get a flu shot, that you change it every year because that, that virus is reassorted, it's changed. And what we're seeing here with the coronavirus is it's changing. And now we have a highly infectious strain, the Delta strain. It started um, in late 2020. And of course, it's now becoming the dominant strain around the world, which is what you expect because it's more infectious than the other strains. So it's kind of pushed all the other strains out of its way. And that's now what we're dealing with both here in Australia, but right around the world. Jane Holton, you have been chair of the World Health Organisation board. Was it wrong of the WHO to take what China said about the origins of the virus at face value? There's been a whole review done on this, Chris, and I think that review is pretty um, direct in saying that there should have been more inquiry and there should have been earlier action, and that's important. And there's no doubt now that the question of how 
those recommendations get implemented is really important. It is a problem for the WHO, uh, the World Health Organization. They have no powers to forcibly enter any country. Can you imagine how we'd feel if they turned up on our border saying, we insist we're coming in regardless? Sure. So it's a bit of a delicate task. But yes, uh, there was a lack of quick action. And I think we all know the consequences of that. Now, you've been described in various circles as fascinating, blunt, bold, powerful, detail-obsessed. Is it true you once told a group in Canberra, haven't any of you got balls? What was that in reference to? <laughs> Look, th that is a, a lovely piece of urban mythology. Um, I don't think really? I've ever made that particular... No, no, no absolutely. Um, I, I, may, I may have said something more to the effect of um, toughen up princess, which is also <laughs> fairly blunt, let's be honest. Uh, but, uh, no, the, the, the reference to anatomy, no, I'm not so sure, but uh, it's, it's a kind of nice story, don't you think? It is a great story, but what I've seen of you, especially publicly as someone who cuts to the chase, gets things done sums up things pretty quickly, all the things the public service is not very good at. So how frustrating has your job been for 43 years? <laughs> yes, well, um, it is true. And a number of people have said to me over many years, including people I know in business, they, they've said to me, well, you're not the normal public servant, are you? <laughs> and you're right. I mean, my, my strength in being able to synthesise, come to the point and then communicate has always been an asset for me. And sometimes that does re get regarded as being a bit too blunt and I'm conscious of not causing offence unnecessarily. But I've always found uh, that people actually value you being able to talk to them directly, uh, mm. being able to be honest with people, and certainly in all the interactions I've had with politicians of both persuasions, but also with the public, I think very often people would just really rather you level with them and you tell them the truth. Yeah, I think you're right. You also created an international diplomatic incident when you were at university in Canberra. Um, now, is this another urban myth or did you upset the Croatians? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that is not an urban myth. That is um, a university reality. Uh, it is true that uh, as a, a teenager and being slightly frustrated by some people I was in a uh, scavenger hunt team with and being told by the uh, gentleman in the group that us girls could go and get the small value items, uh, in frustration, I said to my oh. female colleagues, right, right, <laughs> what's worth most points here? And off we went and uh, we, shall we say, borrowed uh, the uh, flag <laughs> symbols on the front of the illegal Croatian embassy in Deakin. Now, no. I have to, to have to say, in, in mitigation, I have to say, we did knock on the door first to see whether we could <laughs> borrow them. There being nobody home and having the benefits of a, um, an adjustable spanner in my car, we went up the pergola and we kind of borrowed them. Finders keepers, really? Well, so, of course, we had full intention to return them when we'd uh, gotten the points in the scavenger hunt. And uh, what we didn't know is that the federal police followed us to the Australian National University and <laughs> came up the stairs. And it is fair to say that the people who had um, set this as a target in the scavenger hunt, all of whom were law students, to say that they went every shade of white and grey as we came through <laughs> the door with these signs, I will never forget that sight, I can tell you. I can just imagine. So we've established that you're naughty as well as the other traits. So put that aside. You've worked for John Howard, uh, Kevin Rudd, Tony Abbott, Malcolm Turnbull, Scott Morrison. Who's the best? Oh, you ne I mean, what stays on tour, Chris? You, ne you never have a favourite. <laughs> it's like your kids. Of course. Um, COVID from here. Will we have a reopening at 80% double vax, Jane, or will some of these premiers run their own countries? Look, I'm worried about that, Chris. I really am. Um, look, we are the one country, and it worries me that Australians may not be able to reunite with each other over the Christmas period. And look, the truth is, no one around the world uh, believes that we can completely eliminate this virus from around the world. Uh, at some point, we have to get off this horse and we have to uh, figure out how to live life with COVID around. No one wants to do that until the majority of the community is well protected with vaccine. Uh, so what I worry about is that in some states where vaccine rates are, are lagging uh, and where some people think that they can continue uh, indefinitely, it would appear, with this approach, that we may see two different kinds of Australia. And I don't think that's what any of us would like. So I think we do need to have a conversation about what 
our reopening strategy looks like. And that's not the same as dealing with outbreaks, which, of course, is what we're seeing at the moment in New South Wales and, um, and in Victoria. And look, right across the ditch in New Zealand, they're dealing with an outbreak as well. We've got to deal with those while we vaccinate people. But then I think an honest conversation about how we're going to live life while we get back to something that looks like normal is really important. But it's ridiculous to think you can open an international border in, say, the next three years, which we've got to do, and then open our domestic borders in the next six months, which we've got to do, and not have Delta in your community. Look what happened in Victoria. They went short, fast, early, all of that sort of stuff. And now look at the situation they're in. That's just a reality check. Queensland and WA need to get that through their heads, don't they? Well, look, I, I think everyone needs to recognise that uh, there is going to be COVID in Australia at some point. And it's one of the reasons I'm arguing, Chris, so hard for people in South Australia and WA and Queensland to go out and get vaccinated. Because yeah. notwithstanding closed borders, um, we know... Look at New Zealand, uh, look at all these other places, look at mm. Taiwan, who were doing well, look at Japan that was doing well, look at Korea that was doing well. Yeah. It's very hard to defeat Delta, and the best thing we can do is protect ourselves and our loved ones. Jane, these vaccination rates are quite extraordinary. They're almost inspiring. You've got New South Wales and Victoria soaring at the moment, and I guess outbreaks create a sense of fear motivation, don't they? Look, they do, and we know that human beings aren't very good at assessing personal risk, particularly if that personal risk isn't literally right under their nose. It's just how we're all wired. Um, but I do think what we're seeing in particularly New South Wales and those western suburbs, uh, people are doing a fantastic job in coming out for vaccination. I'm worried, though, about the states where we're not seeing people come out, where those rates are less than 50%. Yeah, it is a concern. Now, apart from your 17 senior roles at the moment, you've taken up also a board position with the Naval Group and they're building the $90 billion subs. Gee, I tell you what, mm. you like a challenge, don't you? Uh, that's true, Chris. I do like a challenge and I've always had a particular interest in this world. Um, I came from a family that actually uh, had a very close connection to defence industry, actually. Ah. And so and the work that I did, uh, in particularly in the Department of Finance, uh, working on the Air Warfare Destroyer, meant that I have a very particular interest and uh, this was an opportunity that was frankly too good to resist. Uh, submarines are something that I've had a long interest in. So I'm really happy to be joining the Australian Board of, of Naval Group because of course, this work is now being taken over by an Australian uh, organised and run company and, of course, using great skills and capabilities that we have here in Australia. Is it too late to change the contract and turn diesel into nuclear? <laughs> well, we're not being asked to do that at the moment. Um, look, at the end of the day, obviously, uh, you're always happy to have a discussion with somebody if that's what they're interested in. But, but we're focused very much on delivering on the contract. And uh, that's something that we are particularly um, keen to work very closely, not only with Defence in Canberra, but also all of the industries that are going to actually help supply uh, this supply chain, which is going to be great for jobs in Australia, as well as keeping us protected. Peter Credlin was right. It was a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure.